welcome to another STARS webinar. I'm David Dorn, Director of Programs and Communication at STARS. This is the 10th STARS webinar, and today we have over 100 participants joining the discussion from across the globe. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Today we talk with Jan Jenisch, CEO of Lafarge Holzin, about his personal leadership experience and his vision for the future. Mr. Jenisch was appointed CEO of Lafarge Holzin, the global leader in building materials and solutions in September 2017. From 2012 to 2017, he served as CEO of SICA, a leading manufacturer of products and systems for the building materials and automotive sector. Mr. Jenisch joined SICA in 1996 and went on to work in various management functions and countries. He was appointed to the management board of SICA in 2004 as head of the industry division, and he served as president Asia Pacific from 2007 to 2012. Mr. Jenisch is also a non-executive director of the privately held Glass Trisch Holding. He did his studies in Switzerland and the US, is a graduate of the University of Tibu, and holds an MBA. Good morning to you, Mr. Jenisch, and thank you for taking the time to speak in this webinar. Yes, uh, good morning, David, and uh, good morning to everyone who is joining us this morning. Very exciting to still have stars going, uh, even so we cannot personally meet. So thank you very much for organizing this event this morning. We now have 30 minutes to discuss with Mr. Jenisch. I will take the privilege to ask the first couple questions. In the meantime, if you have any questions for Mr. Jenisch, please use the Q&A feature below to type in your question. Without any further ado, uh, let's get right into it and let's start with the elephant in the room, COVID-19. Mr. Jenisch, how has COVID-19 impacted your own work routine? And for Lafarge Holzim as a global company, uh, what have been the biggest changes caused by COVID-19? Well, uh, where to start? Um, let me start with the company. I, I think um, every industry is uh, differently affected or disrupted. Um, and um, our disruption, maybe we are fortunate that we have a quite a decentralized business model. So uh, we usually sell in the countries what we produce in the country. So we don't have much uh, across the country supply chain issues like other industries. And we also have a strong and empowered management who can um, adapt to the situation. Because even COVID-19 is affecting all countries in the world. The uh, magnitude is, is very different and also the, uh, the actions the governments are taking. So, so you have to make uh, smart local decisions and uh, there's not one size uh, fits all uh, for the company globally. Um, if I'm standing here today, I think uh, normally I spend, um, I think about 50 or 60% of my nights uh, not at home. We are traveling, uh, visiting our countries, our operations, uh, especially uh, meeting the people, uh, participating in conferences. And this has not happened for the past six months. So uh, uh, I'm sleeping at home now uh, full time, which, uh, is a new experience and um, works actually better than uh, uh, maybe my family was expecting. Uh, now, um, I think fortunately we have now all the technology to make this possible. So uh, we, we have been uh, fully able to home office uh, before COVID-19 and then also with this modern video technology, I think uh, the quality is, is very good. For me personally, I, I struggled more in the beginning to get used to the telephone calls and the video conferencing. Um, now I, um, um, I kind of uh, like it uh, because uh, the efficiency is uh, partly very much increased. Uh, give you an example, we are currently reviewing uh, the country strategies. So we have about 50 key countries where we have uh, uh, our operations. And uh, in the past, normally you try to visit the country um, and, and meet the people personally, um, which is better than video, but it takes a lot of time. So, 
So this year we are actually able to review all 50 countries myself on the video. So uh, because you need uh, one hour preparation, one hour video, and, and so you can do like four or five countries a day. And that's what we are doing at the moment. So that's kind of exciting. And, um, and um, yeah, then we have, of course, many other changes. Our company adapted quite well. We have a strong uh, uh, health and security organization in the company. So we were uh, quite well prepared uh, from January onwards to uh, keep our people safe and healthy and uh, keep operations running. You just mentioned working from home or working uh, remotely as a key feature of doing business during the pandemic. Uh, what is your experience of leading teams remotely? What do you see as the key factors to make those teams successful? Well, I don't know if there's uh, any, uh, any basic rule here. I think it helps a lot if you have met the people before. So uh, uh, I have basically everyone I meet now on video. I met personally in the past, so, so there's some sort of um, relationship, we know each other. So the video actually is not so much disturbing compared if you really have uh, new and, um, and fresh people. What, um, what I like to do is because the, the personal interaction is missing. So when I do videos, I, we try to also talk about the personal situation. For example, when I do my uh, crisis meeting, um, which was very intense in March, April, and May, um, and then we start with personal situations. So we have participants from India, from uh, US, from China, from Latin America, and everyone was reporting at the beginning what the lockdown means for them, what it means for the family, and, and that is, uh, was always a good start. So we, we tried to keep our uh, uh, some personal topics and not only talk about the uh, facts and figures of business. What features of doing business in the COVID-19 era do you also expect to survive into the post-pandemic era? Yeah, we will see that. I, uh, one area for sure is, uh, is all the digital. We had a situation before that digital was, uh, uh, you know, maybe the best accepted in maybe in the US, maybe in emerging markets, and Europe was uh, rather slow, at least in our industry, and now we see a big interest uh, from the customer side, from the business partners to, uh, to take on these digital tools. So we have a huge acceleration of, uh, let's say, customer ordering uh, online versus uh, the past. Doing business safely and keeping employees healthy is a key challenge for all companies during the pandemic. You mentioned before that um, Lafarge Holzing already before the pandemic had a very strong health and safety organization. So I'm wondering, what do you think of this idea of adding a chief health officer to the leadership team? Is that something you consider at Lafarge Holzing? Depends a bit on the industry. We, we, we have this, we have a chief sustainability officer um, already in our management board. And then we have, due to the big size of our operation and the big number of uh, factories we are operating, we have a very strong, we call it business resilience team, who takes care of crisis like COVID-19 and who takes care of uh, the health of the employees. So we were um, very fast able to monitor this crisis and give uh, the right advice and take the right actions uh, in the countries. When you started as CEO at Lafarge Holzim in 2017, you, you must have had a very long list of to-dos regarding the integration and transformation of the company. If now you look back on the agenda you set yourself in 2017, um, where do you stand in percentage terms? What, what key milestones are already behind you? And what are the key milestones still ahead for Lafarge Holzim? Yes, we, I think we had a good plan from the start. We, we started our strategy 2022 uh, and a um, big part of the strategy was, first of all, to, uh, to give, uh, empower the countries back. We had uh, too much uh, decisions were discussed or taken at corporate, which should be better be uh, developed and uh, proposed from the countries. So we, we took one layer of management out and uh, made sure that the countries are really profit and loss leaders. 
and, um, and can make the right entrepreneurial decisions. Um, with this, I think we, uh, we finalized the merger by closing the big uh, legacy headquarter offices uh, in Zurich, but uh, also in Paris and um, made the whole company much leaner and much more focused on our top KPIs. Um, we, uh, I think we um, achieved a lot on the cost side. If you look at our numbers, we closed last year with a free cash flow of more than 3 billion Swiss francs. Uh, was never achieved like that before. So the operational efficiency has been, uh, um, I would say, we brought the company to the right level. Um, reduced the, the debt by more than 5 billion um, to have a much better balance sheet, which also helps us now a lot to weather to weather this crisis. Uh, what's ahead for us? I think uh, we have a lot to do in the field of sustainability. We are accelerating. We are just launched our new uh, uh, low carbon uh, concrete range, uh, which we call EcoPack, the fantastic product. It has up to one third of the product is made out of recycled um, uh, building waste. Um, in Switzerland, we have launched the uh, Sustaino, uh, the first cement uh, also using uh, recycled uh, construction waste. In this case, uh, almost 20% of that cement is made out of recycled material. So we have um, a lot of streams to do. You know, already one of the biggest waste recycling companies in the world. We did more than 48 million tons of waste recycling, which we use as alternative raw material as alternative fuel, but also to mix with our products to have much uh, greener, more sustainable products. And, and this we have to further develop and further accelerate. And I'm very excited we participate in the New York Climate Week in uh, 10 days time. And uh, we will be one of the uh, key companies uh, featured in that event. If you look at the whole building materials industry, how far is it in its transition to clean energy technologies? And what kind of technologies do you see as having the biggest potential? The industry has already done a, a quite a lot over the last uh, 20 years to make the production line cleans, to save energy, to use alternative uh, materials, not only for fuel, also for the raw materials. But here we will see uh, much more progress. And we have also a, a very radical projects to uh, capture the CO2 emissions in the plant in the future. And uh, very confident that uh, our industry will, uh, will man manage these challenges very well. We have two questions from Bruno Gehrig. Uh, he's a board member of Merki Baumann and former chairman of uh, Swiss and Swiss Life and former board member of uh, Roche, UBS and Swiss National Bank. Um, he's asking, has the merger of Lafarge and Holzin brought the re expected results? What could one make better in the merging process? <laughs> oh, you know, I think it was um, the merger was was good for many reasons, and um, especially um, the country positions were really strengthened. When you look in North America, Lafarge was a market leader in Canada, Holzin in the U.S. Now we have more than 6 billion US dollars of sales in one of the most attractive markets of North America. So we really strengthened uh, our country positions very well. And, and I think that's the biggest outcome from the merger. Uh, maybe we were focusing too much on corporate synergies uh, during the first phases of the merger, but you know, you, uh, no one is perfect. And, um, and now we have to prove that we can put all that new profile really to work. Obviously, you look at our share price, uh, uh, it's not uh, that appreciated at this point in time, but um, our teams are very motivated to uh, put this new profile and uh, this great company um, to work. Mr. Gerig's uh, second question is about uh, Lafarge Holzin's margin. He's asking, in 2020, you have experienced a very small decrease of the margin. Why is that so in a period where other firms have suffered a collapse in their margin? We have started um, very early to tackle the crisis. So we had in the first week of January, we had a full alarm of our health teams globally to uh, protect uh, our people, our customers, our partners. And we started mid-March already when uh, 
Some people were still debating uh, if this crisis is hitting us globally or not. We started our action plan, uh, health uh, cost and cash, uh, which we are steering here from the headquarter and all companies are participating and, um, and executing with very high speed. You have to use such a crisis. You have uh, many things um, on the cost side, which you can optimize. Um, we should not forget that uh, before the crisis, the world economy was running at full capacity. Everyone was busy. Everyone was giving you price increases um, every year. And now is the time where we can uh, revert some of uh, those things and uh, can come to a much lower, much lower cost base, which we are currently doing. The next question comes from Stars alumnus Pablo Avila. He's a business development director at Terras Capital in Madrid. He's asking, where do you see the cement industry in 10 to 20 years? Which will be the main trends and how are you going to drive your organization to get there? I think um, cementitious materials or cement-based concrete mortars, but also other building materials like prefabricated elements um, is the best building material. It's uh, the longest lasting, it can be fully recycled. It's the best for insulation and it has the, the best uh, base for design, both on the flexibility to do design and then also on the strength levels. I think if you look ahead in 10 years time, we will have um, the products need to be developed um, uh, to much more performance. So we will see more high strength concrete to be able to do the needed buildings with uh, less volume, but uh, with much stronger structures. And um, then of course we will have with the sustainability, especially uh, recycling old materials, we will see uh, a big, big effort. We have then more modular buildings in the future. So we will have uh, uh, more parts being produced in factories and just assembled on the construction site. I would say these are the three trends plus then the digital side where the design and also the material selection will be fully uh, digital supported in the future. We have a question from Hans Roth. He's the chairman of Eurasia Competence based in Yangon, Myanmar. He's asking about the engagement of Lafarge Holzim in East and Southeast Asia and the future plans for that region. When we started our strategy, um, we also made some decisions on what countries we want to invest, we want to grow, and what countries are maybe having a, a better off with another owner. So, so we made a decision that uh, Southeast Asia is a growing market, but um, will be very much influenced by the Chinese players. So we have uh, already divested our activities in Malaysia, in Singapore, in uh, Indonesia and also in Myanmar. If we move on from the industry specific questions to your personal leadership experience, I would like to ask you about the decision making process as CEO. Um, before making an important decision about a challenge or opportunity ahead for Lafarge Holzing, as the CEO, how do you approach that decision? What does your decision process um, look like? I think to make smart decisions, you have to have the, you have to ask the competent people. I think what I see normally not at Lafarge Scholzin, but in principle, too many people uh, sit in boardrooms or sit in offices and believe they can uh, make uh, super decisions on on other markets and countries. Uh, my style is I want to have a proposal from the people who actually run the business for a couple of reasons. First of all, they know the business the best. They know the options you might have in a market to invest or to increase the price, introduce new products. So they are the, the people who have that knowledge. And then last but not least, that's also the person then responsible for executing and being um, um, responsible for those decisions. So in an ideal world, for example, when we do investment projects, in the past you have you have one department calculating it, uh, you have one country executing it, you have someone taking the decision. You have many people and at the end, no one is responsible, right? The guy executing will say that was a wrong equipment <laughs> and it was a wrong calculation. And I'm trying to avoid that and make sure that for any decision or especially for any initiatives we are running, it's great to have 
one person who is finally responsible. As the CEO, do you also spend time on coaching your top talents? And, and how do you coach them? What, what do you try to pass on to them? Well, I, I don't know if I'm good at this or not. That other, you have to ask other people. But I think it's very key also in the new world to engage with many people. So I'm a, a big uh, supporter of uh, flat structures. If you have a flat structure, that only works if you have quite a high span of direct reports. So I have, I think, around 15 people reporting to me. Because if I only have five, maybe like other CEOs or leaders, then you have basically already an extra management layer. So I try to keep things flat and also ask my people that in these times nowadays where everything moves so fast, but we have all this information available and all the tools from smartphones to emails that uh, maybe a leadership span of 10 to 20 people is is rather normal, whereas 20 years ago, maybe it was five to eight people. So, uh, so I think this is very key. Um, a part of that, I'm trying to engage with the leaders and the talents you have in the company. We have 200 uh, senior leaders defined, so who are running the country, so who are running significant parts of our business. And I'm trying before COVID-19, um, I always target to meet each of those 200 um, at least three times a year. So we're going to meet uh, one time at our global uh, uh, Far Shoals and Conference. We're going to meet one time at our business school. And then I have to find another occasion. Because it's very important in this modern world to really interact with the people from the markets and not just uh, read uh, reports in the headquarter. So that's what I'm trying to do and, and to really engage with many people and not just a handful of people. We have a question from Michaela Merz. She is a partner at PwC in Zug. She's asking, what was the reason to change from Sika to Lafarge Holzin? And what is the biggest difference between leading Sika and leading Lafarge Holzin? Oh, that's a, um, so it was, of course, the challenge. I mean, we, we, uh, we have been um, at Sika as a supplier to Lafarge Holzin, so we knew each other. Um, a little bit from that angle and then to have an opportunity to uh, complete the merger Lafarge Holzim and bring this company on, the, uh, on a, a different track for the future that was a big motivation yes that's why I that's why I joined the company. Uh, difference in leadership um, it's not so much difference in leadership I again if I believe in flat styles and engaging with the people. And so uh, the difference is not that big. If you have at Sika, we had uh, uh, now 20,000 employees at Lafarge also, we have 72,000 employees. Um, it's three times the number, but that doesn't mean uh, that you have to have a different style of management. The next question comes from Stars Alumna Siun and Chi, financial controller at CI in Singapore. Um, can you share the key changes of Companies KPI um, between pre-COVID and now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, okay, I, I tell you what we are doing at Lafarge Holzim, and then I don't know if this is uh, useful for anyone else. So, so we had our KPIs uh, before COVID was uh, growth, uh, operating profit margin, cash flow, and return on investment. So, I think pretty classical, and and we made sure that those uh, four KPIs are the top KPIs for everyone in the organization. Now, when, when COVID was hitting us, um, we, um, we decided that this crisis is different from other crises because you have the biggest impact and disruption right away. So March, the virus is hitting uh, all countries in the world. And already in April, we had the biggest decrease in volumes and sales at Lafarge Holzim, and then recovered very fast. So that's a situation where we decided we don't make a restructuring exercise or something. The biggest focus has to be now on cash and on avoiding bad debt. So, so we made a new crisis dashboard, which is focusing on free cash flow. So which means inventory, accounts payable, accounts receivables. 
And uh, at the same time, we make a double focus on the receivables. Because you will see in the crisis that um, if you are not super careful with the receivables, it's not hitting you instantly, but it's hitting you maybe next year or even a year later when you have accumulated uh, bad debt with customers who might go into bankruptcy or have difficulties uh, to pay. So this was our um, big change to move more from uh, operating profit uh, to cash flow because that's uh, um, the focus we need in this crisis. The next question comes from Doris Albisse. She's the executive chairman of Evalu Globe in Zurich. She's asking which corporate culture aspects have helped during the pandemic and which ones could be enhanced? Oh, at our company, we have um, a strong health and safety culture and that was very well organized. So that helped us a lot. So uh, um, even to start in the office, to have uh, precautions in the office or to decide uh, how to protect the people, that was quite easy for us because we have the people and the process in place um, to implement that. Then uh, secondly, we were fortunate enough that the company is already uh, home office able, I think since 10 years time. So we didn't have a, a, a problem that we had people in sales or people in finance uh, who uh, could not work from home. We were always uh, fully able to work from home. So also here was a very smooth uh, transition to these new challenges. We have another question from Stars alumna Sonia volkov Wald. She's the CEO of uh, the Greater Zurich area. She's asking whether you also see positive aspects of COVID-19 and the impact it had on Lafarge Holzim as a company and for you as a CEO personally. Well, okay. Well, um, I mean, when we see the, I mean, the, really the, um, the negative situation we have for many people, in, especially in emerging markets who uh, lost their um, economic base or who lost uh, family members. It's, it's now hard to uh, really imagine that uh, something is positive. If I look ahead and uh, we are not sure how the economy will respond now, we see now the, that uh, the, the zero percent uh, interest uh, policies from the governments or the central banks will probably continue for the next five to ten years. So I have a, um, it's very hard to find something positive in this crisis. Um, for me to run the company, I'm uh, fully motivated. You always have to remember that, and I tell that my people, you know, we as leaders, we have no reason to feel sorry about ourselves. We are the ones who uh, have to encourage and lead and ensure everyone is safe and that we have a future together. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm never feeling sorry or I'm uh, uh, worried about myself. But, but to come back to the question, something positive from COVID-19, that's, uh, um, I think that would not be the right thing to, to really think about. If you look back in your career and then to current leadership trends today and into the future, what changes do you see for the role of leaders? <laughs> well, well, obviously, the, I mean, what has, it's sometimes interesting when you sometimes watch movies from the 70s or they, from the 70s or something that, and you realize that the tone, how people talk to each other, you know, big hierarchies and uh, very commanding. You can, you can see how much actually has moved and how we uh, work together. And people want to be, I think, inspired today. They want to um, make sure they, they bring value to the company, but they also want to be treated as, uh, with respect and with empowerment. I, for me, the biggest change is that uh, we shouldn't think in hierarchies, we should think in tasks, in initiatives for the company, and in the future we will even see that we have more uh, teams taking care of various aspects and not too much depart, department thinking, and this is my department, and this is mine. I think we, we all have to work uh, much more on initiatives, on topics, and, uh, and in a very flat and uh, empowering way. So, and I think this will continue if I look at the young people today. And um, that's a big challenge uh, uh, for, for older people like myself now to, uh, to keep up with the young people and make sure that uh, we spend enough time and uh, 
understand each other. We have a question from STARS alumna Sonali Sarma. She's the head of learning and development at ACC Limited in Mumbai. Her question is short and to the point. Attitude versus ability. What would you choose and why? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I think without ability, attitude doesn't help you, right? Uh, so, so if you don't know, uh, if you know nothing about how to run a factory or how to work in sales or how to be a, a good engineer or a good uh, finance person, I think. Uh, to have a, a great attitude that everyone likes you or you're a team player, that doesn't help the company. So I, I think if, if I have to prioritize, I think um, the competence of the people has to be there, has to grow. And then the attitude, I mean, we all, we just talked about it uh, also, how we want to work with each other. It's clear, I don't like people who have a bad attitude, who are... Uh, arrogant or or don't uh, are not respectful to people, but that that's also clear. What has been your motivation to become a leader, and has it changed over time? No, I you know I never had the target to be CEO of Lafarge Holcim or any other company. I think what is important that you do things you like to do and that you have a passion about. So I was. Every phase of my career, I had, uh, I was excited and I had a big passion. And um, and then you need obviously a lot of energy and uh, to um, to move up. We have already gone into overtime, but as a take home for everyone attending today's webinar, I would like to ask you one final question. Across your whole career, what have been the three most important lessons learned from your personal leadership experience? Oh, the three most important. I, I think we come back. The first one is really to uh, have the courage for empowerment. To have the courage to, uh, to not uh, tell people what to do, but to ask people what we should do. I think this is, uh, this is very important. Um, maybe the second um, learning is when you are younger. So when you are a sales manager, for example, you have to be very... Uh, decisive and strong so your leadership style is uh, is actually stronger than now and now as a, a leader of the company i have to listen and get advice from many more people so uh, so i'm in listening mode uh, uh, most of my time you see me now talking because you asked me to talk <laughs> to stars uh, but uh, you will see that 80% uh, of my day, I'm listening to other people. And this is a, a change when you, when you move up and also very important. And maybe the last one we also talked about is it's very important when you get older like me, that you keep in touch with the young people. I see that a lot of people my age, they, they, I think they spend too much time with same age groups. So, uh, and, and I like to uh, meet younger people to really, uh, I try to keep up and, and also to be challenged huh? because the young people are, are much more challenging than my own generation. So these are maybe just a, a few comments uh, regarding your question. With that wonderful closing statement, really summing up the, the essence of STARS, I would like to thank you very much, Mr. Yenish, for your time and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Mr. Yenish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining and always remember to uh, keep healthy and uh, keep strong. I would also like to thank all our alumni who participated in this webinar. In the next STARS webinar on September 18, we talk with Dr. Sherry Xian. She's the founding partner of iCarbonX, China's first health tech unicorn. Uh, we will talk about why Shenzhen is the place to be for tech startups. I hope to see you there. In the meantime, take care and stay healthy. Thank you and goodbye.